Hello everyone and welcome to the special presentation. My name is Lori. I'm with Nick Software. I am joined with Brenda Hipsher. She's with X-Rite as well as our special guest Christopher Dodds. Uh, Chris is a fantastic nature and wildlife photographer. I personally have enjoyed his work for several years now. He's one of my favorite nature photographers. Beautiful images and he's a Canon uh, Northern Explorer of Light. He's an X-Rite Colorado expert. He's been photographing for over 27 years and if you've seen Chris's work you know exactly what I mean when I say he absolutely captures the essence of the animals that he captures beautiful images I think everyone's really going to enjoy this presentation what I'd like to do is to introduce you to Brenda with x right hey good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are in the world thank you for joining us on this special webinar today and thank you Laurie and Nick Software for co-sponsoring this with uh, x right we're just delighted to be here Christopher Dodds is uh, a truly as you say a wonderful nature photographer and Chris we're just very grateful to have you with us thank you again everyone for attending and without further ado let's get on to mr. Christopher Dodds and his presentation take it away Chris Thank you very much, Brenda and Laurie and x right and Nick Software. And hello, everybody. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today um, and show you uh, about my workflow, um, how I'm treating images from capture through till what you see on the web and in print. Um, I'm going to start a little bit um, here. First, I'll just, you know, you can find me at chrisdoddsphoto.com. And my big presence is naturephotographyblog.com. I find chrisdodsphoto.com, like a lot of people, uh, primary website is hard to maintain, whereas the blog tends to stay current. So do check out naturephotographyblog.com. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to progress through a series of images. And here's we've got something from Sabi Sands from a recent uh, uh, safari I was on. Um, my workflow is the result of um, sort of my entire experience in photography. And so that started with film and film cameras. And then I apprenticed in the darkroom, um, both color and black and white uh, image processing at the time. And of course, that was in the chemical days. And uh, taking that knowledge forward and picking up a little bit here, or there, and everywhere. And, and of course, people do share a little bit of their workflow and um, uh, the tools that they use um, and how to process an image post capture but it all starts with the capture so what do I mean by that um, I mean that you know with today's cameras they're capable of so very much the automatic modes aperture priority shutter priority program they're all very very capable for the large part of what people take pictures of where they start to lose it a little bit is things like birds in flight because the camera is very good at determining that the picture you're taking is a landscape or a landscape with a group of people in it or inside uh, generally the top of the picture is lighter than the bottom of the picture and with nature photography with landscapes that works with birds in flight it doesn't necessarily work so we have to have a little bit more creative input in the capture process to make sure that we start with as much information as possible on the raw file so I'm always shooting raw with my digital cameras and 99% of the time I'm in manual mode so manual mode if you go and search in my blog for sunny 16 there's a rule that says you know when it's sunny um, 1 over the ISO at f16 and you can use equivalent exposures if you want a narrower depth of field or a larger depth of field than that or quicker shutter speed um, but it all starts there and then we have the great tool of history on a digital camera and that shows us a graphical representation of the data we've captured generally I try to expose to the right which doesn't mean I overexpose the whites I expose the whites correctly to the right hand side but make sure they don't touch the histogram a midtone I may push a little to the right so in film speak we were overexposing a little bit and you can actually experiment yourself take an image with uh, some white snow for instance and expose it so that you're roughly when you're metering plus one and two thirds for some cameras plus two for other cameras take a picture make sure that nothing is touching on the right hand side which is the white side of the image and then take another picture of something like a leaf or a tree trunk which is dark and you'll see that towards the right hand side of the image 
Now, if you focus and zoom in just on the dark portion of the image, the more you increase the exposure, the more light you allow into the camera, the further to the right you push the histogram without ever touching the right-hand side. And you'll see as you do that, if you look on the information panel of your uh, camera, uh, you'll see that the image file size grows, which means you're capturing more data. Now, I wouldn't go too, too extreme with today's cameras, um, but, uh, but that's where it all starts. Now, we've spent a fortune on cameras. We often you see people out there with massive lenses and the latest technology in cameras. But in my mind, you're wasting your money if you're not operating in a color-managed fashion. So that's where X-Rite comes in for me. And my history with X-Rite goes all the way back to um, Grey Tag Macbeth. When, they, uh, when I first heard about I1 Photo and first got introduced to it by a friend of mine, um, that was in the days before X-Rite had purchased the uh, I1 Photo from uh, Grey Tag Macbeth. So fast forward, here we are. The single most important thing to do is ensure that from camera to camera, so if you're shooting with two lenses and two camera bodies, and from the capture to make sure that the colors match, and then from there you've got to your output. So that could be your display, your projector, or your printer. Now your display, your projector, and your printer, you've got your display, there's ambient light levels are changing all the time. So for instance, in my uh, studio office here, um, you know, I like to out work with the windows open during the day, and of course at night they're closed, and I'm working on the lights in the room. Um, so color managed workflow, you can actually will monitor the ambient light levels and make adjustments for you. Um, then you've got a projector out, but everybody that's a photographer that doesn't understand color, color management properly dreads the day that they project an image on a wall because they know it's going to fall apart and it really can look, it can really make or break your presentation whether or not you're operating with a color managed workflow. So by that you can have something as simple as an i1 Display Pro tool which I travel with all the time now and it will actually calibrate not only a projector to your computer, to your screen, but also it'll make allowances for the screen color. So there's different, of course, technologies for the screens that we see out there. Some of them are gray, some of them are white. If you're having to project on a painted wall, is it actually white or is it an off-white? Um, a color managed workflow can you know, actually compensate for all of those things. And then lastly, there's your print. For me, the image isn't finished until I have a print in front of me. Now, the print, the quality of the print um, is largely dependent on the color management work, color managed workflow um, you have different types of paper, different finishes, and a lot of, um, of the, the big brands out there, for instance, the Canon, the Epson, the uh, Ilford, you can get profiles from their websites online, but in my case, I love to make my own profiles and actually make sure that it's that exact. So when I have time, I do that. Now, why would I go to all this trouble? The reason I do it is so that when I sell a print today to somebody with one image, same print to somebody else in six months, the two prints side by side will look the same. They'll look the same as the image on my computer screen, and they'll look the same as when I project the image more or less. Um, and that's, that's how important color management is to me. Um, I want to just... Uh, still got a few slides here to scroll through. Um, bald eagles here. Um, I'm just going to go through a little bit quicker on these and get you straight into how I use Nix software to process my images. And when I say process, it's I'm using um, Adobe Photoshop. You may be using Lightroom or Aperture and the plugins all work uh, with all of those software um, packages. I'll just go a little bit quicker here. There's polar bears. Um, you can extract details. You can you can um, open up shadows. 
you can really increase the dynamic range of uh, images. And one of the great things with Nick's software is I'm rediscovering older images as well and bringing out detail which I didn't even know existed in those images. So I'll go a little bit quicker here and here we are. So let's open up Photoshop. And here's an image of a northern hawk owl that we'll start with. Um, so like I said, it's important to start with a properly exposed image. And for this image, that means that the histogram, you'll see information spread. So the black here in the face is going to be on the left-hand side of the histogram, and the white in the snow is, of course, going to be on the right-hand side of the histogram. And I want to be careful not to touch the right-hand side. And so this is where we're starting with the image. And then I'm in Photoshop here. So what I'm going to do is create a new layer here, uh, which is the command J. And I'm going to go up to Filters and Convert for Smart Filters. So it's saying, it's uh, giving me a confirm message. There we are. And the next step for me, and so by doing this, what happens is anytime I open up this master image, I have it, uh, the layer is always here. And as I add effects or make changes to the image, I can always go back and tweak that change. Um, and that's important to me. As my taste changes, um, often what happens is you look at an image in six months and what may have been sort of a trend uh, six months ago may not be now, and it's, easy, it's much easier to just go in and tweak the one component. So there was uh, I'm opening up uh, Color Effects Pro now on this image. Actually, I'd be just because I want to show you something in the difference, the brightness between the two eyes here, I'm going to cancel this and open up Viveza 2 instead. So uh, here's Viveza. Now the eyes are the first thing that engages us in an image here. So I just want to touch base here. This is um, uh, the U-Point technology. It's an awesome uh, development that Nick Software has made. Um, and what they've done is they've basically enabled us to very selectively make adjustments and changes. So what I'm looking at precisely here is there's a difference between these two eyes and brightness. Um, one of the nice things about photographing snow is that the ambient light is bounced around and reflected and it's a nice fill uh, to the underside or the shadow side of an image. But I do see that difference. There's a catch light, a natural catch light up here in, the, in its left hand or when I view the right hand eye, and the left hand eye is a little bit darker. So I can drop a control point there and you can change the size. Now, what exactly is it selecting? Um, you have a good idea because of the radius of the circle that we can see that's changing. So let's just, if you come over here into the control point list and click in this little box here on the right hand side, it gives you a very clear picture of exactly what is being selected and what you will be adjusting. And all I'm going to do here is to actually go to shadow and just increase it a little bit. And we can turn off that sort of overlay or mask so, and then the brightness as well. I'll just increase the brightness just a little bit. So, there we go. Um, you can also make other selective changes either by lightening or darkening an area of an image. In this image, um, I just wanted to show you that one little step. Um, and then in future images that we work on in this session, I'll show you what I typically do to eyes of mammals and things. So let's start with this. So that was Viveza, and that's, you can see here, the Viveza adjustment. I can turn it on and off here by toggling the, uh, the eyeball here on layer. And you can see it's very slight, but there's a difference, and it does make a nice difference. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up um, Color Effects Pro 4, and you're going to see on the right-hand side of my screen here, say OK. Um, Let's move this over a little bit. So here we are. And what exactly is this? It's a user interface. And right now, let's just go over here. I believe there's about 52 or 55 filters, I can't remember, uh, in totality here that uh, are available to us. And we can alter an image by simply selecting them. 
Um, but what Nick has been smart enough to do here is they've been smart enough to realize that there's different types of photographers out there using their product. So you've got wedding photographers, you've got photojournalists perhaps, you've got nature photographers. In nature, you've got wildlife and you've got landscape. Um, you can see up here we've got architecture, travel, and nature. The nature one is the one I've typically been coming to. And what they've done is they've selected here the most sort of uh, applicable filters to the genre of photography. So that it narrows down your, your uh, um, the decisions that you have to make when it comes to, uh, to uh, working on an image. Um, so what we can do here is uh, brilliance and warmth. So we can just play around and you can, so if we collect uh, brilliance and warm, warmth here, you can warm up an image just by sliding the slider over. So you see it's very easy to overdo it. One of the things that most people do when they're working on an image is overdo everything. So what I like to do is I like to overdo it and then back off. Um, a lot of images today, uh, and saturation as well, uh, a lot of images today on the web are overdone, uh, both by warmth and saturation. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just go back to the zeros Let's just go back roughly zero, so two, there. So this is where I'm starting, and I see it's obviously cold weather. It's cool light. It's winter light. It's not necessarily harsh sunlight at this point. There is some haze or cloud cover in the sky, um, and I'll just but I will warm it up a bit to try to uh, um, just make it a little bit more pleasing and. And there you can see I've done very little there. Let's take a look at the, uh, we can compare. Um, so that's this second button over here. And you can divide the screens and you can actually change the place. Um, so one side is with the effect and the other side is without. And let's just go a little bit further. So you can see how it's dramatically changed there. But I just want to warm it up a little bit. So we're going to commit to this. And... Let's just go back to the full screen here, and then we'll add another filter. So what I want to do is extract a little bit more detail. Um, and we're going to go over here. Let's use the uh, uh, detail extractor. So the detail extractor sometimes overdoes it uh, in a big way. But what you can see it's done here is it's created almost like an HDR sort of uh, look to the snow there if you see all the details that came out. So let's just have a look at the split screen. And on the right hand side you can see that the effect is applied. Now it's, you can see that it's stacked on top of the brilliant, Brilliance Warmth filter so they're both there. Um, which is great because you're just working on everything all on the same screen and it's adding one effect to the other. Um, now Let's say this is great when I look at the bird. Let's let's take the details and go a little bit extreme here. Um, that's obviously way overdone, but you can see, you can see that you can uh, you can vary the details, and then we can vary the contrast. And it's always good to try and see and go to extremes on all of the different sliders to see what they're going to do for you, and even saturation in this window. So we can even saturate more or desaturate. Out of the image. They're all creative tools. Um, so here what would I do when I'm working on this image? I really like the idea of being able to see more of the details in the snow. And of course I want to bring out the details in the feathers as well. Now I want to do it without overdoing it. So let's just um, get a big picture here. I like to uh, sometimes just move this so that it's um, sort of two-thirds, one-third split, get an idea of what's happening with the image. Um, I'm going to just back off the saturation a little bit here and contrast details. There's no real number to, to there's a magic number for every image, but you can see what happens when you've overdone it, how HDR it looks. Um, there's a lot of um, um, sort of almost grungy effects that are going on. So let's back this off. Something like there. Now, 
now we're there. Now I find that there's areas where there's too much detail still. Um, so we can actually add detail only, for instance, to the face if that's what you want it to do. So before and after. Now, in this case, I did like the idea of having the entire bird with some of the snow affected by the filter. So let's take a look there. If I back, go back and forth, you can see it's subtle, but there is an increase in detail in the snow. It increases the shadow, which is the texture and the pattern in the snow. Um, and if I, if I really wanted to minimize the effect, I have the control points here. You can, where it says control points, you have a plus and a minus. So you can actually undo the effect in a selected area of the snow. You can add another one over here. Let's go back over. And another negative here. Now what I'm in the process of doing these days, this detail extractor is the, is the new favorite filter. And what I was using before I'll show you, let's just stack it on top, but then I'm gonna come back and play back and forth between two filters for you and do that live for you. There's tonal contrast here. Now you can see what tonal contrast does. So first I'll undo or deselect the detail extractor filter. So now I'm just the brilliance and warmth is active and the tonal contrast is active. This is the way I've pretty much been working with my images. Um, and then let's take a look here and see what the adjustments do. So you can see that it's a little bit less HDR and by going, so what happens there is you can really isolate the, uh, the subject from the snow or you can add some texture to the snow. But what I'm gonna do now is select, let's take a look here at the control points. Let's have a look at what it's selected. What is selected exactly? It's the bird. And then we can make some changes to highlight contrast. So you can see what that does. When it goes to the maximum, there's more detail in the snow. When it's the minimum, there's less detail in the snow. The midtones, this will make a big difference because there's midtones in the bird. You can see very easily the effect from one extreme to the other. Now this is also a really, when people say, Chris, how do you get your images so sharp? How come I look at those images and they seem so sharp? A lot of it is here in the mid-tone adjustment, but it's the tonal contrast part of the Nick software that I think is the secret to the recipe. Um, shadow adjustments here. So this to me looks really, uh, really good. Uh, you can play around with images for a long time in, uh, in Nick. Now, the other, you can, let's have a look here. Once you have the effect, the opacity slider is a great way to adjust the, the global situation between saturation, shadows, midtones, and highlights. So if you say that's great, just a little bit less, there we go, and say, you could say okay at this point. So you can see the before and the after. What I'd like to do is add a little bit more contrast at this point. So I'm gonna open up Color Effects Pro again, and you'll see that all of the settings that we had made are still here on the right-hand side. We can still add or subtract any of the filters. So remember I had deactivated the detail extractor. I'm gonna reactivate it now and see what that does. Um, so. You see how it makes the image look sharper? Look at the face feathers the, around the, 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 the face there. So let's open this up. And here we are. You can do the wings. Add another control point on the other wing.
change the opacity. Now you can also group um, two control points or more together. So just by clicking the first active control point and then shift click. Now the two are selected and um, apparently that was VESA, you see. So we can still make adjustments that will work on both control points. So we'll go to about 80% and we'll say OK. And from here, the next step for this image is uh, unsharp mask and then your output. So the sharpening is uh, uh, relative to or a function of your output. So it'll be one um, unsharp mask setting for various size print or another. You can also use in the NIC software, the um, Sharpener Pro, um, which in all honesty, I've just started to use, and it's a really great way to do some very selective sharpening as well. Let's um, let's take a look at um, another image. Um, Chris, um, a couple people were wondering if maybe you could show the histogram in Photoshop, if that's possible. Um, you know how to get let's there. have a look here. Um, I think it's under. I find the, uh, can you go to the window menu under window or or view either one of those two? Let's see. Oh, yeah. And then click on histogram right there. Histogram. Perfect. Thank you. So there's the histogram. Let's take a look here at the histogram. So here's the histogram. And on when you're looking at the image, you have the uh, right-hand side here are the whites. So you can see that this big peak here is all the white background. And then you have the mid-tones here which are the mid-tones in the bird, and the darkest part of the bird is on the left-hand side. And you can see by it being a little bit away from the right-hand side, you can see the detail in the blacks, and by being a little bit before, obviously, on the right-hand side, you have detail in most of the whites, um, and actually all the whites, except for where it's out of focus in the background. Um, yeah. Let's go to, um, here we go, back to full screen. So here's a, a bald eagle, and the reason I brought this one up is actually because it's a, a Canon 1D Mark II file. So I don't know if anybody has, has been around since the Canon 1D Mark II, but a lot of people said that that camera was not capable of uh, much detail in the whites at all. So. Here we have an image. You can look, we were talking about the histogram here. So you can see the histogram. Um, it's again, we have whites in the bird. It's not quite all the way up to the right hand side of the histogram. And the darks are not full black without detail. And therefore, they're not touching the left hand side of the histogram. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll make a new layer, which is the uh, Command J on, uh, on a Mac computer, and then filter. And then we'll go convert for smart filters. Say OK. So there we are. So on this image, what I'm going to start with is, uh, let's just start with uh, um, ColorFX Pro 4. OK. And let's start this one with the detail extractor. All right. So detail extractor is here, and we're looking. There's a tremendous amount of uh, of uh, sort of HDR look to this. Um, we can increase or decrease contrast. Let's just make some changes so that things look a little bit more real here. And. Specifically looking to try to make adjustments that make the image look. Uh, see, that's a super extreme, but you can see how much detail was or is in the, in the original file here. Um, but what I want to do is there, things look a little better decent or saturation. All right, so let's start generally the saturation. Contrast, we can bring up contrast here, things here. And the detail extractor. 
Now again, it's very easy to overdo all of this, um, but let's start somewhere around here. Maybe a little bit more saturation. Now this is uh, an eagle from uh, Homer, Alaska, uh, where we do eagle workshops. And uh, it's the weather has transitioned from really cold to uh, much warmer. And you can see that the snow is changing the rain and there's some snowflakes and some, some wet spots in the feathers there. Um, so we'll say, okay, now I'm gonna add another filter. And in this case, we're gonna add some contrast. So I wanna go to pro contrast. And here we can do it globally as well. Um, just you can, you can correct for a color cast if there was one here. And generally, it's the contrast slider that I like to use here. Um, and I'll go just a few points to add some contrast. The other option you have is dynamic contrast, which is a perceived concept. It's how we, it's a different way of calculating the contrast. And I generally will try one than the other. Um, and then once there, I, I realize that the background, I really don't want to add contrast to the background. In this case, I'm going to just use some control points to lessen the effect in the background. There we go. Then you can, you can try the brilliance warmth. Let's go back. Brilliance and warmth. And what I have done is I have, um, let's go back to, sorry about that. What I haven't done was uh, add the filter. I replaced it instead. So let's add a little bit of dynamic contrast here. There we go. Again, I'm going to use the control points to remove the effect from the background. There we go. You can even uh, now I'm going to press the add filter. Let's have a look at brilliance and warmth. Get a drink of water here. And. You can try adding a little bit of warmth here. Again, just a few points. Let's say, all right. Now, what I didn't show you on this one was the way I processed the image when I presented it on the web. Um, and what, what I did there was, I'll just start again here. So I'm gonna press cancel. So there's different ways of achieving the same effect at the end. So here I am on the uh, layer again and I will open up Color Effects Pro 4. All right, so here we are. So the first step I typically make is tonal contrast. So once we're in the tonal contrast window, let's just knock it down a little bit from the factory presets or the, the way it opens up there. Increase the saturation a little bit. And then you can, this contrast type, it's default is standard. Now you can, you can cursor over the different settings here and see from high pass to fine, to balanced, to strong. And generally, in this case, let's take a look. I like the standard effect better. Then we can add filter and we can add to that the um, detail extractor. And again, it's seasons to take away some of what's down there. But you can see, um, just for instance, here is the contrast. Let's increase the contrast a little bit more. And the details here, it's about 11%. I mean, I'm typically between uh, 12 and, and you know, 20%. Uh, if you go much further to the right, you see how much detail there is or could be. Obviously, that doesn't look real anymore. So, um, you know, 11, 12%. Saturation, that's a function of, uh, of personal taste. 
Now, because I've got tonal contrast filter first, let's undo that, and you can see the difference. So it's cumulative effect between the two filters that we're going for here to get the maximum amount of detail out of the, uh, the, the white feathers here. Um, and um, let's just drop a couple of uh, negative control points up in the sky. Keep that from getting too dark. And so for each image, it's, it's really a question of personal taste and some trial and error. So you can go back and forth between the different components or filters within Color Effects Pro and bring the image where you would like it for your taste. Um, what I'm going to do now is add another filter. And I, I want to increase the contrast, which is going to darken those uh, feathers in the bottom, the dark part of the, the bird. So we'll go to, uh, we can go to Pro Contrast. And then here we can globally correct the contrast somewhat and increase. So it's, if you, if you go much further, you'll see how much is overdone and then back it off to where it looks good. And then you can go between dynamic contrast and correct contrast. So dynamic contrast seems to be a little bit smoother um, and more pleasing to the eye, to me anyway. Um, let's take a look here. Then you can be very selective. You can increase the shadow or decrease the effect on the sh in the shadows or in the highlights. So let's try that and you can see what happens. So the effect is less pronounced or more pronounced in shadows and highlights. And again there. And so um, we could, you know, if you wanted to, you know, when you're looking at the image, always try to think about what the other options are, what the other filters that are available to you within uh, the Color Effects Pro software um, and think what they might do to the image. And the great thing here is you can just click add filter and let's just try brilliance and warmth, see what that does to our image. And if you don't like it, you can always undo it. You can always change it uh, later. So you can try warming an image up a little bit. And again, you really don't want to go too, too far. Uh, you want to try to keep these as, as natural as, uh, as, as possible. Um, and then let's take a look here, saturation a little bit more. It's a bit overdone on the yellows there on the beak. Say okay. So you can see just by clicking here um, on the smart filter uh, layer, the eyeball here, the global effect of all those filters we've added within Color Effects Pro 4, um, this is the before and the after. And we haven't used Unsharp Mask yet. So, I mean, typically if you're looking what I would do to the image uh, to post it online uh, from here, if it was gonna be an 800 pixel on the longest size um, JPEG, then basically what I would do is go to image mode and from 16 bits, bring it down to eight and then image image size, bring it to 72 DPI for uh, screen presentation um, and for web presentation. And then um, I would do uh, file automate and fit image and make sure that 800 pixels in both of those boxes. Then I would run Unsharp Mask. It's something like uh, 210.30. Uh, just because a lot of people have been asking me that in the past, I thought it'd be useful for you to, to know that. Um, and then you're, you're actually, what, what we could do is uh, if you were going to sharpen this now for whatever reason, Within this uh, uh, smart filter layer here, you can actually do filter, sharpen, unsharp mask, and give it a little bit of sharpening um, right there. And you see what I've done is I've brought up the noise and the darks there. So I'm going to, that's exaggerated. That's much sharper than I would typically use it. Um, so you see here now what's happened is, now I have a, a, another layer on the right-hand side within the layer. So it's the smart filters are stacked. 
Here's the Color Effects Pro and all of those filters we used within it. And you can turn that on and off. And here is the Nsharp mask. And this eyeball turns the sharpening on or off. It's, and it's all compound or cumulative um, adjustments that we've done. So when I see the, uh, the image now, I'm seeing there's some noise in the, uh, in the darks here. So it's probably a good time to, to show you um, Define. So Nick Define 2.0, again, you can see that this is going to be a cumulative effect. It's going to add to what we've already done with Color Effects Pro and Unsharp Mask here and open up Define. One of the great things about Define is it's so automatic. It does everything for you. And so you can see what it's done is it's established various zones where there is or is not noise or where it deems it's important or not important. And for the most part, it does an extremely good job. Now let's say um, there was a part of this image where it applied noise reduction and um, I feel it should have more detail. So the, the function of the, the result of the noise reduction is I can see up here in these fine feathers that, let's go to the before and after. So you can see, hopefully, I have no idea if you can actually see the, um, the effect of, of these filters in this fine scale uh, through the web podcast, but um, you can see that, let's see what we got here, there we go. The right hand side you have the noise reduction applied, left hand side you don't. So if I think that you best see it, for instance, in the eye. Um, typically the effect of the noise reduction is, is, is it lowers the details or removes some detail from the image. So that's obviously overdone. When I look, you can see the water drops in the eye here, the detail in the, uh, the eye itself. And then let's go over there and it kind of disappears. So what I'm going to do is go back to the full screen preview of the work. And then I'm going to actually say the important part to me is the face. So I'm going to put this control point here which is the negative control point, it's a minus sign. I'm going to increase the size of that to the face. Let's see here. There we go. And let it work. And there you go. So now um, the biggest difference that I can see when I move the before and after the split screen, the biggest area where there is less noise is in the darks down here, the shoulder but also in the background, which I can see noise up here. I'm not sure if you can or not. And so that, that would pretty much be it there. Let's say, okay, there you are. Um, let's now, let's have another image. So that would be, that would be how I'd, I'd produce that image. Um, and come up with my final um, master file. And again, I can go back to any image that I've done uh, and, and uh, change any of the, um, any of the uh, settings. If I feel after the fact that I've overdone something or underdone something, or um, let's have a look in full screen mode here. All right, because we were talking about histograms, here's the image. This is right out of the camera. Um, so to my mind, what I'm seeing here is um, there, you know, there is some fine detail in the blacks, which means that if you look up here in the histogram, it never touched on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I have some room to leave detail in the whites. But I still feel that I'd like to see a little bit more detail in the darks. I'd like to see some more detail in the, in the lights here. And um, uh, overall, the image should should come out uh, sharper. Uh, the native uh, uh, file, I shoot raw. Um, so this is just being converted one for one, just bang very quickly using Adobe Camera Raw. And um, let's just go ahead and I'm seeing how what seemed to be taking forever for time to pass is disappearing very quickly before me. And I also want to take the opportunity to tell you that I had quite a catastrophe a little bit earlier, just before the podcast, I had a hard drive failure and um, my nerves were over the edge. 
Um, so I've calmed down quite a bit now. So let's just go ahead and press Command J. And there I have my, my extra layer to filter, convert for smart filters. Say OK. And in this image, I'm going to show you what I do. A lot of the time for the eye here, you'll see that the eye, there's plenty of detail. You can see the catch light. I can actually see the reflection of the cliff I was standing on. This is St. Paul Island. And um, so there is plenty of detail, but I believe there's a lot more detail in the eye. And the eye is the key to the soul for your subject when it's a photograph. So let's go ahead and, uh, and first look at what we can do with the eyeball with the VESA. So let's open up the VESA. And here's our image in Favisa. And we're talking about those control points. So let's add a control point. Um, let me first show you something else because there's different, you know, there's, there's uh, many different ways of achieving the same end. So using just Favisa, what we could do is, I know I want to do some work on the cheek here. Uh, so the, so the whites and the yellow part of the bill here. I also know I want to do something on the eyeball. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, if you see this circle that's growing and shrinking here, I'm going to start with the biggest area, and then after, I'm going to target the eyeball. Um, that's my workflow. So let's just go with the brightness. I know I want to tone down the brightness here just a little bit, and I know that using tonal contrast or detail extra extractor, we're going we're gonna to regain some of the, uh, the details there. So let's just knock down the brightness just a little bit. And the advantage with shooting to the right having the histogram up against the right but not touching, is that when we reduce the brightness of an area of an image, we can do that without creating artifacts or what we call noise in the image. If you do it the other way around and say, okay, I have an image which is underexposed and I need to compensate and brighten it, um, you're starting with much less data. And so as you move the histogram to the right with either the exposure slider when you're doing your raw conversion or shadow highlight tool, or any variation or uh, of curves or uh, any other possible way to brighten the darks, you're introducing noise and that's where it comes from and because it's trying to extract details when they aren't there. Whereas if you start at the right hand side of the histogram, no matter what you do uh, to, to lessen the brightness of an image or extract detail from the brights or the whites, uh, you're not introducing any noise. So I just want to knock down that brightness just a little bit. We can come over here and select the yellow of the bill. And I'm just going to, because for the yellow for the bill, let's take a look here. You can see, obviously, the lighter part is selected. The darker part is not. So let's just see. Go ahead. OK. So I want to lower the brightness there just a little bit. And um, I should also say that before tonal contrast filter or now detail extractor filter, I would actually um, play around with the structure slider here, which is still an option for slight adjustments. But I really don't want to add this effect or, or add to this effect using any one of the other filters I've already shown you, and I'm going to show you again. So I'm not going to touch that. But, um, you know, you can just add a little bit of, let's overdo it here. See? It's like a contrast filter, and it's almost like a, a, a similar effect with tonal contrast, but tonal contrast is a little bit more, uh, or it gives you a little bit more perceived sharpness in the image. So that's why what I'll do here is this. So this big circle, let's put it back there. That's fine. Uh, I knock down the brightness just a couple of percents. And then because the eyeball it falls within that circle, that's why I did the larger area first. Now when I come here and select the eye, Let's take a look at what we're doing. So I just want to select the eye now. Just as I've done just now, that would take away that effect in just the eye. So the larger circle, uh, by putting the smaller circle within it, it'll remove the effect from the first point we applied. Um, but in this case, what I want to do is not only have uh, the image or the eye. Let's go back to see the, there we go. So what I want to do is I don't want to darken the eye, I want to brighten the eye. I want to add some contrast and some sharpness to the eye and that gives me a better look into the bird and it gives it a little bit more life. And so I find that this is a good predictable recipe for eyeballs. So whether it's a northern gannet, uh, a bear, a uh, polar bear, a coastal brown bear, whatever it is, somewhere at seven, nine percent for brightness 
contrast. So contrast, if there was any veins and difference between pupil, uh, um, it'll increase that a little bit. Saturation, about 9%. Structure, about 9%. And shadow, about 9%. So it's some magic nines. Somewhere between 7 and 9 for brightness, contrast, shadow, structure, and shadows. Um, and saturation. And let's take a look at that. Now you can, for the single control, on the left hand, on the right hand side of the uh, control panel here, uh, where the control points are, the right hand side shows the mask, the left hand side shows it's a preview for the effect or not. So you can see it gives a little bit more life to the bird by using those, that formula that I gave you. Um, just look into the eye of the bird there. So we'll say okay. So what have I done so far? Using Vivesa, I have toned down the whites in the cheek here, the yellows in the bill, and then using the magic nine numbers, I've increased structure, the saturation, the contrast uh, of the eyeball. And so now what I want to do is open up Color Effects Pro. Say OK. So here we are. And it started in tonal contrast, which is where I want to be. So tonal contrast filter here. And you can see it is quite overdone as an effect. So we can do uh, global adjustments again. Or what I would typically do here, because I really don't want to, you know, the more uh, contrast or tonal contrast adjustments you make on the background, the darker it is, the grainier or the, the noisier it becomes. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to work with control points right off the bat. So um, let's open up and expand this control point drop down here. And I'll click on the plus. And you'll see that any adjustment started globally, but the moment I dropped that control point, on the cheek of the bird, it, you saw that, uh, well, just I'm going to delete it, and you'll see now it's a global adjustment. And then when I say, even though I'm using the plus, all of a sudden from global, it went to only the control point that I'm using, which is a really great feature. So let's just have, you know, I want to put this on the rough area um, that I'm working, which is the cheek right now. And so let's just turn on so that we can see exactly what we have selected here. So that's, and there's the opacity slider, so there we go. So that's what I want to do here. So what do I want to do there? I want to increase the tonal contrast. Let's take a look by increasing here. And all of a sudden you see all those minute details in the cheek feathers come out. So right now I've overdone it so that you can really see the effect and really draw out the detail. And what I'm going to do is, while that's exaggerated for you to be able to see, I'm going to take another control point and I'm going to put it in the dark sort of shadows down at the bottom. And let's turn on that mask so that we can see exactly what's selected. Let's move this around. So it selected the darks. And then in the shadow portion here, okay, let's take a look and see what this slider does. So in the, if the shadows are minus 100, it actually removes detail. And as we slide it right and increase the shadow tonal contrast, you'll see that it gets chunkier. So you, it, that's a bit overdone for sure. So let's just tone that down. And then we're always going to work with. So even though the darks are selected, still play a little bit with the midtone. Uh, slider as well because there is some gray within the black there and then let's bring over the split screen here and see what we've done globally here so you can see that's where we started on the left hand side of the red line that I'm moving around and then as we drag that over you'll see all the details come out of the cheek and you'll see a, I'm hoping you can see the details come out of the darks now again don't go by the numbers I'm using because I'm trying to achieve an effect that's going to transmit to your screen at home during the webinar. Um, but this is uh, certainly a big part of how I'm working on images. Um, 
And then from here, let's just say, okay, the effect is overdone, which is going to help the next step of what I want to show you, which is noise reduction on the background. Because it's a dark background, we did make some adjustments which increased the noise in the background or actually created some noise in the background. So we could hit the define here, define two, open that up. And it's, it's saying it's working because it's, it's determining what parts it wants to remove noise from for us. All right, so you can see the noise is virtually gone in the background already. There we go. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do reduce, and I'm going to, as I've shown you already, I really, I really like the effect. I really like the way it's removed the noise in the background. But what it's done is it's actually taken away some of the contrast and sharpness that we created, or perceived sharpness we created in the feathers in the face. And it's still working. There we go. So I'll take the negative control point, place it on the cheek, and the area within the circle that I'm adjusting here, the effect will not, the noise reduction won't take away any detail, remove any details from the cheek. So at this point we could say okay, and then I would move on to the sharpening, you know, for the, uh, for the output. And I'm wondering, do I have time for another image? I probably do. I'm going to go ahead anyway until they shut me down, I think, because sure. the flow of the... <laughs> Let's see here. Um, okay, let's... Uh, that's another image I could do. Um, something with more zones in it. Um, yeah, let's, hang on, there's probably, if I've got time for one more, I think, so uh, let's go with the crested auklet. Okay, you know, mostly because it's got the, the, a lot of the blacks in it, it's a lot of the darks a lot of people have trouble with. So let's uh, full screen mode and let's review quickly the histogram again. Again, we have, what we're looking to do in this image is obviously have detail in the darks. So I want to make sure that the left hand side of the histogram, nothing's touching. If this big peak here, or spike in the bar graph, was against the left-hand side, or if any of this histogram touched the left-hand side, that would be the blacks that had no detail. So even though I'm looking at this part of the dark area of the bird, and I don't really see a lot of detail, it's there for me to grab and extract. Uh, and I know that because the data is represented clearly on the image on the histogram. And I know that the lightest parts on the beak here, the eye, and the white feathers, they're all contain a lot of detail because they're up against the right hand side and not touching. Um, and we could have probably, I probably could have added another third of a stop uh, to this image, but I knew that uh, I wanted to maintain as much detail in the white feather as possible. And so this is what uh, we started with. So again, starting with as much data as possible, starting with capture, um, command J, another layer, Filter, convert to smart filters, say OK. And here we are. And so this one, what I'm going to do is um, I want to darken actually a couple of areas. So I want to open up uh, the VESA. Say OK, it's VESA 2. And what I want to do is I just want to touch down. I want to bring down the, because there was a bit of, uh, it was an overcast day, bright overcast, there is a little tiny bit of glare here uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the lightest area here. So what I want to do is just tone down the brightness, just, you know, six. I, I guess what I did for the image itself, for the master image was six, but just to get the effect here on our web presentation here, I'm going to exaggerate that a little bit. There we go. Um, and then I think in the eyeball, I want to bring out some, I want to tone it down a little bit and increase the contrast. So let's, let's see here. So the brightness here, just to get some detail out of the light colored eye, which is unique in the, uh, 
in the world of animals, almost a white eye. There we go. So what's selected? Let's have a quick look again, just to get you into the habit. Here, um, here we go. We've got the, the lightest part of the eye is what's selected. And I'm going to tone down the brightness, and I'm going to exaggerate uh, for the web cast here. Say 11. I want to increase the contrast a bit. Bit of saturation. Certainly some structure, 9% structure. And I'm not going to touch the shadow here, and I'm going to warm it up a little bit, 9%. And that's what I'm doing in Vivesa here. Uh, okay. And then the next step for me is to open up Color Effects Pro 4. And say OK. Now, let's go straight. So here we are in tonal contrast. So I want to this is what we're starting with after VESA adjustments. And then the first filter I want to use is tonal contrast. So let's play around with the tonal contrast. So the highlights, what's the highlights affecting? It's obviously the lightest part of the eye, the white feathers, the lightest part of the bill here. And so we'll go to the extreme versus. So you can see the difference between the two. And what I'm realizing is I should probably be trying the uh, detail extractor on this image to see what effect that gives. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on detail extractor. Ah. So there's a huge amount of detail in those darks. But the more work you do on them, the more of the filter you apply to it, you see it goes gray, but it also brings all kinds of noise in the image. So that's really overdone. So you really want to gingerly adjust the image. So in detail, I would say somewhere around 11%. The contrast, let's go to zero and increase the contrast to 100% to see what it does at that extreme. And so obviously, I will The preview is taking some time, so let's just give it what time it needs. There we go. Then we're getting back to you. Now, what's happening here? What I'm seeing as we increase this effect of contrast is we're bringing out all kinds of noise in the dark background, which is the dark cliffs at St. Paul Island. So um, I want to be very selective so I can either use control points to remove the effect from the background, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense because it would be a lot of control points. And it makes more sense to me to just use a plus control point. And you see the effect is gone from the image except from more or less within the area of effect here. Let's take a look at what we're affecting. So, so you see it's one of the interesting observations you can make while you're playing with the image like this is although the circle, you can see I'm moving the circle, the effect also affects or is imposed upon the adjacent tonalities to what you think or what your perceived area of influence is with just using the circle. So it's a really good tool to come back and forth and turn on and off this tool, which shows you exactly what you're affecting. So let's, now, I was showing you how to increase or de decrease the effect using the three steps up here. But one of the great features here is that using the opacity is there at, at zero, there's no effect. And then you can gradually increase. So what I like to do is I like to set the detail extractor, the contrast and saturation higher than I think I need, and then I'll work it backwards or lessen the effect using the opacity slider. And so that's a question of taste and, and personal preference. Um, so that's the detail extractor. Let's add a filter. Let's add uh, brilliance and warmth. If you want to warm it up a little bit. 
one of the things to remember is that you always using brilliance and so I'm going to overdo this to show you something quickly before we end this. Um, so what I've done is I've put a nice warm color in the bird here, but I've also that color has come across in the background as well. And so you, again, you can either use the negative control points to remove the effect from the background, or you simply use a, the plus control point to choose where the effect is applied. And I think that's, uh, we're running on, how's our time doing here? Chris, I think we'll probably wrap it up with maybe just a couple questions, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, and I wanted to thank you for this great presentation. Beautiful images, by the way, of course. <laughs> very nice. Well, thank you very much. You're very kind. I realize it was a bit of a, a, a nervous, chunky start to the presentation, <laughs> but uh, oh. I think I overcame that a little bit. Yep, no, it was great. Um, so there's, uh, I think the probably overall question that people are asking again, and it might be brand new to them, but the using of smart filters and why you would use smart filters. If you could just kind of quickly review that versus maybe just duplicating a layer, for instance. Sure. So one of the greatest, you know, things with the smart filter, and I've used them since I, you know, since they were available on Photoshop, is that if I save this file now as a TIFF or as a PSD file or then one of the great things is I can come back here, I can open up the film, the, 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 uh, the image, and I still see the layers on the right-hand side of my screen here, like I'm circling the, um, the cursor around. And then I can go back and say, you know, I changed something on the eye, for instance, and in this case, it was the Vesa setting. And I really liked what it did, but it, it wasn't strong enough. I was too careful in applying that change or that filter. So... Let me just wait for my computer here. If I double click on Vivesa, so it's I'm back to being able, without having to rebuild the entire image from scratch, I can come back here and make an adjustment to that filter or um, effect. So there I just, I lowered the brightness again on the beak here. Say okay. Now if I do file save, and keep the layers intact, when I open up the file later, I can come back and change it. So that's the smart filter part. It's still smart enough to be able to change it. If I hadn't done that, for instance, um, you work on an image, you apply sharpening, you save the, the image, you're done. That's it. If you weren't using smart filters, you can't lessen the effect of the sharpness or increase it. Um, it's easier to add some sharpness to it, but you can't remove any. So you'd have to re, you know, start from the beginning. Uh, for the post uh, processing of your image, and with uh, the, the Nick filters, I think it's great because it's so easy to sit in front of your computer, you know, apply a whole bunch of filters to an image, and realize after the fact when you print it that you really overdid a lot of it, and you have to start again unless you've used the smart filter option within Photoshop. Is there any other questions? That's great. Thank you for reviewing that. Um, here's here's the last question, and a lot of people are asking, what size lens do you use? Okay. In general. Yeah, and I, you know, I meant to get to that several times through your presentation, but of course, you get, I get sidetracked so easily. Um, what I use whatever lens I need to use to get the effect that I'm looking for, and a lot of it is, I go out there. For instance, this image, this is uh, Crested Auckland, in St. Paul Island, and um, um, I'm gonna while I'm talking here, I want to. Closing a little bridge again. Uh, so, I like to when the when the light isn't warm, it's not great light. Um, when the light is bright, work tight. That's a good saying. So I use a 500 millimeter most of the time with either a one uh, uh, 1.4 extender or a 2x. Sometimes I even stack them. Which version? And I use Canon, so you could stack version two of the tele extenders. Uh, but version 3, you can no longer stack them. So the trick there is to add a extension tube between the two uh, to get even more extreme magnification. Um, you know, a lot of, since this owl is a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, um, but a lot of the time I do catch myself using the 500 millimeter. Um, I'll go through a, a couple of quick, there's 500 with a doubler, uh, this is a 500 with a 1.4 shot vertically as you see it. And of course, 
you know, I'd like to say that I can I can turn the camera vertical and take a picture like this every single time, but obviously there's uh, there's a lot of uh, practice, there's a lot of misses, and I love challenging myself with even common birds shooting vertically, uh, birds in flight to try to be able to learn how to coordinate the lens and my eye and movements of my body on a gimbal head to track and uh, and shoot these birds. So, you know, I'm not getting this kind of result with every single frame. Um, and then y'all, I also often have to remind myself to shoot wide because a lot of times what you have to think about is you have to think about, you know, you're on safari, you're um, you're shooting a giraffe. Um, if you're shooting just the giraffe head up in the air, you can do that at home in a zoo. Uh, whereas the giraffe in its environment is something that is much obviously it's almost impossible to uh, to photograph in a zoo so you want to try to be mindful of the wider side of things as well for instance here uh, St. Paul Island again you know the temptation is always to throw on the big glass um, and so I have quite a collection of large lenses 800 millimeter 5.6 600 f4 500 f4 the one I'm typically always taking because it's the most versatile lens, when it's paired with the 1.4 and the 2x, is the 500 millimeter f/4 lens. So here, this is straight up 500 millimeter, and obviously I could have gone in a lot closer to get just the fox, but I wouldn't have included the pretty wildflowers in the background. Um, so this is getting down low. The longer focal lengths also help isolate the subject from the background. So you get down really. If, if the higher my angle, so the higher if I was standing up shooting down, I would have had more of the water in focus in this image of the uh, Atlantic Puffin. Uh, so I really love the effect of isolating the subject as well using big glass. Is there any other questions? Well, I think we're going to wrap it up for now. Uh, I wanted to thank you, Chris, uh, from Nick Software and from x and all the people that joined us today for your presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you to x -Rite. Thank you to Nick Software. And thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time to watch the presentation.